so I just want to say thank you, everybody. And um, thank you to Dr. Shah and uh, Joe Sullivan for inviting me. And for those of you who may not know, um, I actually kind of got into this world by getting found by my boss. Um, I was uh, found staring off at a blank wall and drooling all over myself. I ended up being diagnosed with Lyme disease. And um, for about 10 days, I laid on the floor, alternating shakes and sweats and a lot of pain. 23 years old, my parents had to help me to the restroom. And then I got better. Um, and then over the next eight years, I got sicker and sicker and sicker and had every psych diagnosis and chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia type diagnosis out there. And it wasn't until I kind of um, did a medical school rotation with um, two amazing doctors in Maine who everyone in their office sounded like they felt exactly like I did. And so I, I knew that I was finally at home. Um, it wasn't great. It wasn't the best feeling because, you know, we're all suffering, but at least I knew something. And I just wanted to say a word of thanks because um, after I met them, uh, they sent my uh, lab testing off to this crazy place called Igenix. And within a couple of weeks, I found out that not only did I have chronic Lyme disease, but I also had babesiosis that had not been diagnosed from eight years prior, um, which is kind of scary because it potentially could have killed me in the short run. And anyway, um, through a course of treatment um, over a period of about four and a half years, I became asymptomatic. And at this time um, that we're doing this presentation, I've been asymptomatic for over 12 years. So I know it's possible. Anybody who knows me knows I burn the candle at both ends very frequently for fun. Um, like to go out and really live my best life. And so if Lyme's in there, it's permanently asleep. I kind of think it's gone. And I just really want to say like at that time, I went to my first ILADS conference and I saw people like Joe B, uh, B Zantier, who I saw on the call earlier today, uh, people like Richard Horowitz and Charles Ray Jones, all of them took me under their wing and really kind of motivated me to give back to this community that had given me my life back. And so just a, it's just such an honor to be here with Dr. Borscano, because if it weren't for people like him and people like Dr. Shaw and Nick Harris, who've done all this work, I literally wouldn't be standing here talking to you. So I just want to say thank you. And so part of what I like to do is to give back and um, give you the opportunity to learn what I've learned from my personal experience, my professional experience in exclusively treating Lyme tick-borne infections and environmentally acquired illnesses over the last 14 years. And then, you know, really trying to put that professional teaching hat on so I can share with you those things that I've learned from that perspective, but then step to the other side and remember what it's like to be a patient. So today, uh, and, and Dr. B, another thanks because a lot of the things where, you know, like you, I like to give so much. A lot of the things that I wanted to cover, you've already kind of touched on. So we're going to highlight a few of the pieces of the clinical presentation of these tick-borne co-infections, and then really, really talk about all the different emerging treatments, especially focusing on things like stationary forms, growing and non-growing forms, and persister forms. And then really just talk about how to come together and make a decision on treatment with that. Um, just a disclaimer, um, I'm going to focus primarily today on the treatment of exoides scapularis and other exoides tick delivered pathogens, um, particularly the parasites and the bacteria, not so much Boston virus. Um, in the end, I do have a resources section because, you know, there's always so much information I want to give you. So you'll have some information about other ticks and what they carry. But if you're ever questioning where to go look for things, find out what's active in your area or the area that your patient is coming in from, tickencounter.org has a really nice sort of resource of what the common, what the pathogen, what the ticks are that are active in your area, as well as the common pathogens that everybody agrees upon are in those. But as we know from the research of TOCARS and many others, we don't just have Lyme disease, anaplasma, Borrelia mimotoi, and different babesias in our exoides ticks, we actually have a whole bunch of other ones. And, you know, we've talked about um, rickettsias today. We've talked about Babesia otocoilii. We have a whole slew of viruses here. And what's really interesting is like the black-legged tick flebovirus, you don't hear a lot of people talking about, but it's literally the most common pathogen in this study. So a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is what we know from our previous experience and our current clinical experience. 
but everything is changing. So keep your eyes peeled and always be uh, kind of learning and growing, taking that next step. Um, and one of the things I found that was really interesting is a lot of people argue whether or not Bartonella is in ticks or not. If you look in Europe and uh, even as back as far as 1999 in the um, exoides ticks that they have over there, they have over 70% of the ticks that are average coming back with different Bartonella species in it. In the United States, we see across the country, we've only got about 2% in this study. But if we go to a specific location, in this case, North Carolina, we've actually got a, almost a five-fold increase in the percentage of Bartonella. So it kind of depends on your location and your tick exposure. Uh, the other thing in the conversation we just had in the Q&A was about, do we see Bartonella without other things? Remember that Bartonella is not just purely tick, uh, a tick uh, born pathogen. It's one of these things that you can see in lice and fleas. And very commonly in my practice where I see people who show up with only Bartonella, it's children with acute pans, pandas type presentations when in their classroom, lice just went through. And then I talk to the teacher and they have four or five kids with acute neuropsychiatric symptoms, OCD, rage, ADHD, out of the blue, anxiety. So just think about what the exposure is and where the person was exposed because so many people are traveling and with our songbirds and the changes in global climate, we're starting to see pathogens pop up where historically they were not. So this is ever changing. So let's talk about Lyme disease here. Um, and Dr. Joe, thanks again for setting this up so well because our, our early localized disease is that summer flu and EM rash type of thing that we've talked about so many times that everybody looks for, and maybe early disseminated has a lot to do with the uveitis or the heart block type of cardiac presentations. But so many of us are seeing people late. The diagnosis was missed. The tick bite wasn't noticed, you know, and then we're having people come in much later in disease with arthritis and neurologic presentations. And then everybody wonders why it's so hard to treat. It's like, well, it's months to years after the initial infection. You know, we're seeing a lot of these 31 kilodalton bands come up in our IgMs, suggestive of infection for 10, 12, 14 months or more. So there, the delay in the presentation of the common symptoms is often why we see people with chronic Lyme disease. And like Dr. B was saying, I just want to do a sort of a public service announcement here on the EM rash. We rarely see them in the literature and EM rash is present 40 to 60% of the time. So we can call it 50%. But this bullseye rash is really only about 20% of true EM rashes. And the problem is that's also an erythema migraines rash, as is that, as are all of those, as are those two. And here's another view of two more. And so when we look at these, we have to understand that 50% of the time, we don't even see these, at least according to the research. Clinically, it's probably more like 20 or 30% or maybe even lower of the time that we're going to see this. But all these are blotches. People are missing these infections because they're looking for the one in the middle. And that's not really a true EM. It's a type of EM. So this is readily available on the internet. You can find all these rashes. So if you're talking to someone else who thinks you need the one in the middle, you can actually educate them and remember that there are multiple different presentations of EM. And as Dr. Boriscano said, uh, lots of different symptoms of Lyme that are pretty nondescript here. One of the ones that I really want to point out, though, is all the GI distress that we see is that this, cr you know, chronic gastritis, colitis, food allergies and leaky gut type of presentations are very commonly related to Lyme disease. Now, obviously there's so many other things that can do it, but this is one of the key things to understand. And um, I'm going to just skip ahead one second here and we'll go back to those. Dr. Uh, Charles Ray Jones, when I uh, trained with him, he was saying that about half of children will present with isolated abdominal pain right? So they have a GI complaint and many, many, many of them are like, have had these multi-million dollar workups, endoscopies, biopsies, and there's no clear etiology. So if you have isolated abdominal pain in a child that you've ruled out all the really common things, think about Lyme disease. It's a really critical component there. The other part is when we go back here and we look at the clinical presentation, how do we differentiate joint pain and nerve pain of Lyme from so many other things. And Dr. Horowitz did this work 
where we look at migratory joint pain and migratory numbness and tingling as key factors indicative of Lyme. Now I see joint pain more commonly related with Lyme and the nerve pain and the migratory paresthesia is more potentially related to Bartonella, but um, in his validated study, we see both of those. And the nice part about seeing this is there's a very small differential for migratory pain. You could have inflammatory bowel disease, gonococcal arthritis, and different hepatitis. And the thing is, these are fairly easy to diagnose, and then we know what to do with them. So it's really, the differential is relatively short. So if you have migratory joint pain, take a look at Lyme disease. It really puts it way up at the top of your differential. Now, the other thing that we see with Lyme in children is a lot of neuropsychiatric presentations. And this will be across the board with our tick-borne infections in kids, but we could see these acute behavioral changes, regression, you could see different vocal, auditory, physical tics, grunting, eye squinting, and then any of these other regressions, like with pans and pandas, we'll see acute food restriction, we'll see enure nocturnal enuresis come back, um, you know, all kinds of things like that. So any oddities, we're going to be thinking about Lyme maybe triggering pans. And then when we get into Bartonella a little bit later, we want to think about that as well, because that could be a trigger. So when we look at treatment, because that's really what we're here for in this session, is we want to think about what we learned in the beginning. And that initial treatment viewpoint was, hey, we need one antibiotic. We want to do a tetracycline, probably doxycycline, unless they can't handle it or they're below eight, in which case we're going to use something like cefuroxime or amoxicillin. Our treatment duration is somewhere between 10 and 21 days. And the reality is we don't really care which one you give people because it's going to work every single time. And it's, you know, most of the time, at least 80% of the time, it's going to work in one course. And that's what I was originally taught. In fact, that's how I was treated. And as much as I want to be pissed off about that, I have to say it is one of the reasons I'm here today. So if I hadn't gotten only 10 days and maybe I'd gotten months of antibiotics, we might not be talking today and I might not have this opportunity to serve in such a way. So as much as I kind of don't like having spent 13 years or so of my life suffering and trying to recover from Lyme and Bartonella um, and Babesiosis, it, th there's a silver lining, I think. So when we look at that kind of 10 day to 21 day treatment protocol, the question is, do we have any evidence that there's actually cure? And I have not seen any evidence of any antibiotic protocol curing Lyme disease. Um, if someone's been, or a monkey or a person's been infected for four to six or more months. And when we look at Monica Ember's work, if we give doxycycline for 28 days, after the monkey has been infected for six months, we have no cure. And if we give IV ceftriaxone followed by two months of oral doxycycline, we cure a whopping 27% of these monkeys. So, and we know that cure is probably clear because they're doing tissue samples on an animal that's been euthanized for science. And whether you agree with it or not, it, this is information we can't get in people. Um, so we, the cure here is, is miserable. I mean, no treatment in medicine that I know of is acceptable if it only works 27% of the time, if we have to treat you for essentially 90 days rather than the 10 days that everybody tells you. So um, it's something uh, to really consider. Now, in their other studies, they've shown cure of, of monkeys occasionally when they've been infected for four months, but below four months, we have no clue. We know about prophylactic treatment in mice, and we, if we give you a 19-day long-acting doxycycline, we can completely prevent a Lyme infection and an anaplasma infection, but we don't know anything between prophylaxis and four months in anything. So when people are telling you 10 or 14, 21 days, we don't, what's that coming from? We just don't have the data. And when Monica Embers and her group has looked at other things, they find that in these monkeys, we see host dependent signs of infection. So not every host is the same. We see a variety of antibody responses. And when you look at this data, it's literally all over the place from zero reactivity ever in an artificially infected monkey to up and down throughout the course, PCR and skin biopsy, positive, negative at different times. It's very variable. And persistence may not be reflected in the fact that antibodies are still made. And Dr. B talked a lot about this. The thing is, the, when they do the research, not just on blood samples like Igenix can do,
but literally they're able to actually take samples from living, these living organisms, these study animals, they're finding metabolically active intact persister Borrelia burgdorferi spirochetes that can then reinfect another organism. So this is showing that despite four and six months of antibiotic treatment, we still have metabolically active persistent infection. So when we look at the infection, I love looking at it and just saying, what is it? And so that I can figure out how to treat it. And the basics of what we know is that we have a cell wall and we have an intracellular space and we happen to have cell wall agents and intracellular agents that help us treat them. So one of the things that I first learned when I started getting into Lyme disease, hey, we can use our cell wall agents. We can use our intracellular agents. We may want to combine them. We might want to treat somebody for six or 12 or 13 weeks, or maybe 12 or 13 months. We might need multiple courses of treatment and that there's actually this role for this crazy stuff called integrative and natural herbal medicine. And we're going to dive into how to put together medications and herbals to get, you know, to come up with the sort of maybe a, a next level treatment so that your patients can um, see greater relief of their suffering and improvement from their symptoms. This is just a quick chart. Um, and when I was with the working group for the ILADS fundamentals that uh, we worked on this for over five years, we came up with this chart. Um, and it's just here for your reference of different cell wall and intracellular agents so that you have a quick reference when you get the slide deck. So let's say we're just starting out and Dr. B referred to some folks who may be new at this, or maybe you're in an area where um, treating tick-borne illnesses is, is kind of looked down upon for more than the standard. Let's just think about a way to start. Maybe we start with a monotherapy. Maybe we start and we just treat them for four weeks and then we reassess. Maybe we're gonna choose an intracellular antibiotic because a lot of our, by the time these infections are presenting, right? Like that four, six, 12 months after the initial infection with this sort of arthritis and neurologic presentation we talked about, very similar to the monkeys in Dr. Ember's study, maybe it's, it's primarily felt to be more intracellular and hiding. So maybe we'll go for that. I personally like to use minocycline when possible over doxycycline. It tends to be more well tolerated, but it also has more active metabolites and may penetrate joints in the brain a little bit more. So a simple starting part might be an intracellular antibiotic with a probiotic. And so then one of the questions I always think to myself is why does everybody say doxycycline is the drug of choice for Lyme disease? And to the best of my knowledge, because doxy is not the best drug in multiple studies for Lyme itself, we also know that it's really good for rickettsial infections, including anaplasma, uh, which comes from deer ticks, and then Ehrlichia and Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which comes from other ticks. But those three infections can be life-threatening. And if we don't want to miss them, um, we feel that they're fairly sensitive to tetracycline derivatives. And th therefore, maybe that's why we want to choose a tetracycline up front, just to make sure we're not missing another infection um, that could have um, that could be treated very quickly and e relatively easily compared to Lyme. Um, and that might be a reason to do that. The other thing I always say is assess, assess, reassess. In my charts, I'm always writing, this is a therapeutic trial of treatment. We go over the risks and benefits. And I say, I'm going to, you know, follow the treatment. We're going to reassess in four weeks. We're going to reassess in eight weeks, but I'm always making sure I use those terms because I want to protect myself and my patient. And really the reason the reassess is not to, for a medical legal reason, it's really just to make sure that you're doing the right thing for your patient. But just again, like use these things because I want all of you to learn how to be experts in this field so that you can go out and actually help people and still be helping people while doing the things in your life you love. Um, Cause I've got my life back now. And the last thing I want to do is go lose my license because I forgot to follow up with somebody. Um, and then sometimes I have to make the hard decision to not refill a prescription um, because someone hasn't followed up. Then what's our next step? Well, maybe we take that basic next step and we say, Hey, I'm comfortable. I got somebody on minocycline or doxy, but maybe they need a little more. So maybe I'll use a cell wall agent. I'll use something like a cefuroxime or an amoxicillin with my minocycline. I'm going to give them a probiotic. If their gut's off, maybe I'm going to give them a second one. So two and three probiotics to protect as we're going higher in our antibiotic protocols may be something that could be very helpful. And again, I'm going to beat the horse to death here. Assess and reassess. Always be monitoring your patient. This is where I use my team a lot. 
So maybe I don't want everybody to follow up every month. It's there are financial concerns. I know we've seen questions about the finances. One of the things I do is just have my, we set us uh, an alarm in our system. And every, every so often, if it's two weeks or three weeks into a treatment, four weeks in, and we just call and get an update. And we just have a canned couple of questions so that we don't necessarily, if we don't need an appointment, don't have one. If you need an appointment, make sure you get them in for that. And then one of the questions from a basic perspective, I get very commonly is like, what kind of dosing do you use? And for most of our medications, we're really looking at using standard dosing. So if you take like clarithromycin, 500 milligrams twice a day is a pretty standard dose. Rifampin, 300 milligrams twice a day. So we're typically going to be at least starting there for most things. Where we see a difference is maybe in azithromycin, where if you look at the kids dosing, it's five to 10 milligrams per kilogram. And typically a Z pack is set up 10 milligrams per kilogram day one, five milligrams per kilograms after that. But what we find is that we typically would want to be at the higher dose range. So rather than 500 milligrams on day one for an adult, and then 250, we're typically doing 250 BID or even 500 once a day. And the same thing for amoxicillin, we tend to push the dosing. And um, some of the pioneers like Dr. Boris got were using things like probenicid and other um, higher dose, you know, other medications to help the dose stay higher, or even just higher doses of amoxicillin. So those tend to be more at the higher end of the range. And so that's kind of like the basics of like, Hey, like Lyme disease is like not that hard to treat or whatever. And then I said earlier that there's like 80% of people will get better according to the CDC, right? The problem we have is what about the other 20%? And so what we find, or I found really interesting is this work out of Johns Hopkins is that they had artificially infected mice with, um, by putting ticks on them that they had artificially infected. And so these ticks that had Lyme disease in them, they found that they were able to transmit persister cells, stationary forms, biofilms, round bodies with the initial bite. And that happened roughly 20% of the time. So I'm not saying that everybody who gets Lyme disease, the 20% who aren't fixed in that 10 to 21 days, um, this is the phenomenon, but the numbers kind of overlap a little bit. So I'd love to see this repeated. And they kind of talked about late persistent Lyme disease, which is what we would think, a late diagnosis, under treatment, been infected for a long time. We have that late arthritic neurologic presentation. But then that 20%, they, they were saying, well, that might be early persistent Lyme disease because we're actually getting persister colonies right away. And what we don't know is, does that mean we get the arthritis in that neurologic presentation that's supposed to be late Lyme disease? Do we get that right away? So keep an eye out for this, but understand that a lot of the people you're seeing, there is science to patent that is getting closer to letting you and your patient understand and all the other skeptics, why they may have this persistent Lyme infection infection. And the, it's the numbers, the percentages are scarily lining up to be that 20%. And so some of these forms, uh, we, a lot of people call them cysts or more properly called a round body, but the spirochete protects itself, right? They've been around for over 15 million years. So a lot longer than humans, they can roll up into a ball and end up in um, this thing we call the round body. And it's essentially the inside out and roll up like an armadillo. And most of our standard antibiotics don't protect them. So now when I start to think about how to treat the person and go from basic to the next level, I'm gonna have to start to think about cell agents, intracellular agents, and then maybe this round bot body side. And so some of our typical cyst or round body forms are highlighted here in the reference chart for you. Some of the common ones that we use though, and in getting into dosing and such are tinidazole. Um, and there's two ways to do this is weight-based or start low and then work your way up. I've always done the start low and, and work your way up version, um, except if somebody's morbidly obese um, because it works really well and we can help control some of the Herxheimer's this way. So we have tinidazole 250 twice a day, um, multiple different ways to do it. One of the more common ways is three days in a row with a four day break. Um, you can go to higher dosing. I typically, like I said, start low. If they get flares when they're on this, it's typically day three to day four. So they're already day four, they're already off. And then they feel like dirt the whole time they're off. We start them the next weekend. They don't really want to do it. We do it again. In three or four cycles of this, they start to actually feel better. 
And once, or it could be months of not feeling well, but hopefully diminishing over that period of time. And then we're going to go up a little bit until we're not getting that result. And this is back to your cytal, which is kind of nice. So it does actually kill off intact spirochetes as well. Uh, the big thing with tinidazole, make sure no alcohol three days before or three days after. We'll talk about disulfiram, but we don't want to have an acid aldehyde reaction that doesn't feel too good. There is a possibility of peripheral neuropathy. Metronidazole is much more well known to do that, but I often will put people on a B complex to help with additional detoxification and to just nourish the nerves a little bit more than maybe they were previously to help minimize that risk. Um, I have not seen this phenomena with tinidazole. I have seen people with peripheral neuropath neuropathic symptoms already flare up and then get better, flare up, get better, flare up, get better, and then better, better, better as we go through a course of tinidazole. The other thing is metronidazole um, doesn't have, as in the test tube studies, doesn't have quite the effect of tinidazole, but it's pretty close. The difference is tinidazole is often not covered and metronidazole, whether it is or it's not, is very uh, relatively um, inexpensive to dirt cheap. Um, the dosing is a little bit higher as a starting point, same kind of uh, general approach. This one is carcinogenic in mice and rats if we overdose them. So that's where our black box warning came in. Now, one of the other things too, another way to do this, and instead of three days on and four days off is actually two weeks on, two weeks off of either one. Um, and I've even had a few people where tinidazole is the only thing that really kind of moves the needle for them. And we've done three and four weeks on with a one week washout period or a break. Um, metronidazole, very similar to tinidazole, except you're not really wanting to have alcohol three days before, but 14 days after. So if you're planning parties and holidays, this is an important one to remember. This has a much longer tail where that disulfiram acid aldehyde reaction could happen. And so we're going to want to, again, keep an eye out for that peripheral neuropathy. Hydroxychloroquine, some study, you're going to hear a lot of this today. Some studies show that it's good. Some studies show that it's bad. Um, and uh, for round bodies, you know, that makes a lot of them or it kills them. The, the jury's kind of out on some of these studies, um, but it, a lot of people use it to alkalinize the intracellular compartment and augment other intracellular antibiotics and how they work. We also have grapefruit seed extract. I've seen studies that show variable results. I don't use a lot of it, but I know a lot of people who do. So just keep that in mind that the studies are out. We also in Lyme have biofilm, and this is Dr. Shappy's work showing us um, the how the biofilm grows over a period of 21 days. And it's this mucopolysaccharide protective measure. Uh, some studies have said they need 200 to 500 times a normal antibiotic dose to penetrate. So we need to go to other uh, perspectives on how to do that. We may, uh, there are different liposomal uh, treatments out there, including liposomal artemisinin that may kind of be like a Trojan horse and get into biofilms. Many people are using different enzymes. I've listed some of the common sort of uh, ones, natokinase, lumbrokinase, serapeptidase, and the different dosing we use. Um, so these are different ways that could potentially help with biofilms. And a lot of these, including some of the combination products are really great for breaking down circulating immune complexes. So we bring in the, that are in the bloodstream, which are bringing down inflammation so they can help with joint pain and potentially help with biofilm. There's a lot of other work been done out there. The problem is, as you see, yes, no for stevia, yes, no for monolorin. Um, the jury's still out and we see a lot of different um, studies coming up with different um, results and we just need more. We just haven't had enough studies to say it one way or the other, but these are certainly reasonable herbs to try. And then if you're looking at essential oils, some of those um, listed there may be helpful as well. Um, I actually, I would say I would tend not to use a lot of those because I don't want my people ingesting them and in an incorrect manner with the amount of cognitive dysfunction and sort of like comparing their treatment to other people. I want to make sure that they're staying safe. Uh, Dapsone, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and daptomycin can uh, have shown antibiofilm properties. And there's a question about disulfiram and azelacillin and potentially uh, working through a biofilm disrupting mechanism as well definitely need some more research there. So keep it in mind. And as we did kind of dive deeper into how to treat these things, I think I want to take a quick pause and say, we're going to throw out logarithmic growth, which is that exponential rapid growth. 
um, which is in strep, 13,000 times a day, Lyme disease, hey, maybe like once every five to 21 days or so. Um, vastly different comparison of Lyme to a lot of these other organisms we're used to treating. I once did a ratio of, hey, if I wanted to treat someone for Lyme disease as, and, and give them as much antibiotic exposure per generation of bug compared to strep, I'd have to treat them for 667 years continuously. So clearly we're not gonna do that. And one of the re ways that we might get around it is looking at stationary forms. Um, so logarithmic is often called growing. Uh, stationary is called growing, uh, non-growing or stationary or persister. Um, and then of the persister forms, we have the microcolony biofilms, we've got round bodies. We also have planktonic spirochete, which is kind of like a suspended animation, hibernating uh, spiral spirochete, but it's not as active as a standard logarithmic Borrelia. Um, and then there are other things like plasmids and granules that we don't really know much about what to do with. When we look at stationary forms, some of the best evidence we have are what herbs to use. We have the kind of our top ones listed here, Cryptolepis, uh, Polygonum cuspidatum or Japanese knotweed and Scutellaria bicalensis, which is Chinese skullcap. Those work for growing and non-growing forms of Lyme. Ju these other three, Juglans, Artemisia and Uncaria, which is cat's claw, these are ones that we typically see people using, but really they found, at least in the Hopkins study, those work for uh, more for the um, non-growing form, the stationary form than actually growing forms. And cryptolepis is actually the only herb or medicine ever treated to eradicate um, Borrelia burgdorferi's uh, stationary forms in subculture. So no one, two, or three antibiotic combination, except for maybe one three IV antibiotic protocol has been shown at least in a Petri dish to eradicate Lyme. So cryptolepis is key. The other thing is every single herb on this page outperformed doxycycline and cefuroxime. So if we're only using medicines, I think we're leaving some healing on the table. This is for your reference. This is where we're, I'm saying, hey, stevia came up, grapefruit seed extract, monolaurin, even colloidal silver has little to no activity here. And then again, just to some, remember, not good for growing people, uh, you know, spirochetes. So if you have an acute person, you might want to be looking at other herbs. And these will all be uh, available for your reference. Disulfiram is one that's been very popular. It inhibits acetaldehyde uh, or it leads to an acetaldehyde reaction. So it inhibits um, aldehyde dehydrogenase. And basically we use this as antibuse. If you don't want to drink, um, we give it to you so that um, if you do drink, you get sick. And we think that there might be an inhibition of Borrelia burgdorferi metabolism by this formation of mixed disulfides with uh, metal ions, but we're really not 100% sure of how this works in Lyme um, from a research perspective, but clinically it appears to. And initially when Dr. Ligner and others were doing that work, we thought that we needed to get to that anti-alcohol uh, level of 500 milligrams a day for six or 12 weeks, and then they'd have that sustained remission. Um, we were starting people way too high, even at 125 milligrams a day, that could be too much. Um, a lot of my patients now, I start at 125 milligrams or half a tablet every other day and work up. Some are really sensitive. We may need to go as low as 25 milligrams every other day. And I've even seen people need 25 milligrams a week, two times a week, working up to three. Um, and really what we're finding is that you don't necessarily need to go to these super high doses. Um, and some people find that they actually do better with an enteric coating. Most of this, anything below a, a half of a tablet is being compounded. Enteric coating does not add a lot to the compounding, but compounding itself can be expensive. So more recently, um, we felt that we don't need to go over 250 milligrams and as little as 25 milligrams a couple of times a week can really change this. And I've had people come in with Lyme and Babesia. They're on chlorothromycin for years. They're really having a hard time stabilizing, they can't walk. And within getting to 125 milligrams a day for just two weeks ha enabled uh, one of my patients to go for a three mile walk for the first time in over eight years. And that's been sustained. Now she's needed to be sustained on um, intermittent disulfiram. But I mean, for someone's life to change so dramatically after eight years of not being able to do anything, it's pretty amazing. And it does have a role. One of the things that we need to be aware of is no drinking, Definitely look for elevated transaminases. I do them frequently in the beginning and then less frequently. 
because there's no alcohol and I love to use a lot of tinctures, I then have to go to things like some of the herbal capsule liver support combinations, arlopoic acid, uh, alpha lipoic acid are great. And also NAC just really like to use a lot of liver support in these people. Um, the big side effect is neuropathy and it usually creeps in on you. So if it starts, stop the medicine. If it, if they haven't told you and they're like, Oh, now I can't feel my feet or I feel it going up my legs very much like diabetic um, neuropathy being axonal. We're going to the long, long, long nerves first. So it'll start up the legs. By the time it gets to the knees, it starts to go to the hands. Um, you got to stop it. You really got to stop it. B-complex and glutathione may help decrease the risk or help them recover. But um, in the literature for use of um, this in um, alcoholics, one to two months, it usually resolves. I've seen people take seven or eight months for their numbness and tingling to resolve because we didn't understand what the cause was in the beginning. So this is a person that you want to really have your team checking in on every couple of weeks. Um, Dapsone, uh, Dr. Horowitz has done a lot of work with this. Um, again, shown some anti-biofilm agent uh, efficacy. Um, this is one that can be a game changer. Um, the single and double dose protocols are um, labor intensive. Dapsone, doxy, refamp, and methylene blue leucovorin, methylated folate, on and on. This is going to be one where you and your team really have to be real closely aligned with your patient and they have to be following everything to a T. So this is your initial protocol um, as far as the double dose Dapsone protocol as Dr. Horowitz published it. And then we basically are working our way up over four weeks to 100 milligrams. And then the treatment part of it, the weeks five to 12, typically are 100 milligrams twice a day. The issue being for me is I don't really, I don't even see my patients getting weeks five through eight. I have to just keep titrating them up. And my people tend to get stuck right around 100 to 125 milligrams with a lot of side effects, but also um, a lot of benefit. So I do seem to have a few people get stuck there. We have to check for G6PD deficiency. And if they are deficient, don't use this. Um, you'll lead to hemolytic anemia. Definitely, this will 100% lead to folate deficiency anemia. You need leucovorin and methylated folate. Anybody of mine who has gone below 30 milligrams, yes, 30 milligrams of methylated folate daily, I've seen people's hemoglobin go from 11 and a half to eight in one week. So it is really, really, really important. For me, um, the leucovorin doesn't seem to be as important, but again, keep them on both. Um, it frequently leads to meth hemoglobinemia and the folate de deficiency anemia. So we do need to be doing the CBCs. In the first four weeks, when any, anybody 100 or below, I tend to do every two weeks a CBC and a meth hemoglobin. Anybody above that, they really need to be um, weekly. And meth uh, methylene blue as a part of this protocol um, has been helpful, but I still see a lot of meth hemoglobinemia. A simple trick is I have a pulse ox. I have people who they get to 93, 92 consistently, and they're feeling like dirt and they have to take a break sometimes or lower their dose. Um, yeah, one of the, so that's kind of some of the high level stuff from basic to advanced on Lyme disease. Um, I wanted to talk touch just briefly on Borrelia miyamotoi before we move to some of the other ones here. We do have um, Borrelia miyamotoi, as Dr. B alluded to, tox is one of the relapsing fever Borrelias that can do uh, create an erythema migraines rash, very commonly leads to meningoencephalitic type of symptoms. And there's hearing loss is very common with this. So if you have somebody with hearing loss or even like really weird presentation of tinnitus, kind of think about Borrelia miyamotoi. And it kind of looks like Lyme plus anaplasma and or Babesia. So when you have that big smear of that pattern recognition that Joe B was talking about, really start to think about tick-borne relapsing fever. Um, I know a little bit about this because I published two of the first 24 cases in the country, which were uh, four, or I should say four of the first 24 cases in the country. That was amongst the first 73 cases in the entire world. And these are the things we see pop out and early in the, a lot of people don't even know what this is right now, but it definitely in the literature has been missed as a, as an anaplasm or a Babesia. The biggest problem is we don't know how to treat it. We just treat it like it's Lyme or Borrelia hermsii. So uh, my, my feeling is keeping it in mind that it's there. I don't know that disulfiram or Dapsone are going to do it, but all of those other things we talked about 
these are so genetically similar. Now, granted, it's a relapsing fever Borrelia, but it is important for you to understand that we don't really have any treatment studies on, on like, no one's really looked at what kills it. So it's important to just, you know, clinically innovate in this case. So if we dive into Babesia, Joe uh, highlighted so many things really well. So I'm just going to touch on a couple. Head pressure is a really big one. So that band around your head, um, air hunger and different bone pain, ribs and other bones, sharp shooting pains. Um, those are kind of some of those hallmarks of thinking about babesiosis. Additionally, if you're looking at the neuropsychiatric symptoms, depression and anxiety are big ones, as well as our POTS symptoms and a lot of dysautonomia, amongst all the other wonderful things we see listed. Some of our standard treatments include um, atovacorn and azithromycin with or without uh, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. We can use malarone, which is atovacorn and perguano with or without a macrolide. And then clindamycin, and I would just ax quinine that because everybody who takes it gets sick. You know, we have horrible side effects, but it is out there. Um, definitely clindamycin is probably an underutilized treatment here, both oral and um, IV, but orally, just remember, it does tend to treat, trigger a little more C. difficile than other oral antibiotics. So just make sure you're on top of your probiotics for that. But this is kind of some of our standard stuff. And really the first two, atovacone and azithromycin are kind of our CDC approach. One quick thing about atovacone, 750 milligrams per 5 ml, 5 ml twice a day. Azithromycin, you can find this on the CDC website right now. Day one is 500 to 1,000 milligrams of azithromycin and all subsequent days are 250 milligrams to 1,000 milligrams of azithromycin. And they say treat for at least seven to 10 days. They don't tell you when to stop and they don't tell you that you can't use higher doses of zith. So if anybody asks you why you're using 500 a day, you can go back to the CDC website and have a reference. There is a lot of possibility um, for resistance. So that's why we're adding in the atovacone and or other dr um, drugs like trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. Um, and then I learned this from Dr. Boriscano. Um, we might wanna treat it for four to five months. And the question is why? Well, atovacone, which is our drug of choice for Babesia microti, takes about a month to get to truly therapeutic levels. And then we need to consider the lifespan of a red blood cell of 90 to 120 days. So maybe instead of doing a 10 day treatment, which is generally recommended, let's do a lot longer. Um, and we'll base it on science that way. Then we look at the BZ Duncani. I think I missed, there we go. Um, and everybody's like treating it the same way as we treat my karate. The problem is when we look at it in vitro culture, azithromycin and tovaquone, clindamycin and quinine don't work. So it wasn't until we saw um, Dr. Um, Schweig and Leone and the other folks at Hopkins doing this paper here on Babizi Duncani that we had any evidence of what really treated it. And really the big ones here are Chinese skullcap and cryptolepis. So now we're starting to see an overlap between some of our Babesia treatments and our Lyme treatments. And if we choose to put medications and herbs together, we we'll start with our herbs, we now know really where at least a starting point is. Also, I wanted to touch on, there's been a lot of talk recently of these emerging Babesia treatments, different ways to do things. Maybe we wanna start with one of our tovaquones or a derivative. Then we wanna add in an Artemisia derivative. Then we wanna look at a tofenoquin or premoquin, azithromycin and then some enzymes. And this kind of came out of some of the conversation with Babesia otocoilii, but whether or not, like Dr. Boris kind of said, whether or not these are present or not in a human being, we are seeing people with multiple different Babesias that are coming back positive. We're seeing that the immunoblot is saying Babesia species, you know, and Babesia genus, but we're not getting Duncani microti and our people are sick with Babesia symptoms. So again, one thing to add on to a tovacone is we do need to take it with a fatty meal to increase its absorbability because you're in the 18 to 20 some percent if you don't take it with fat. And I've seen as high as 48% absorbability with fat. So that's pretty miserable no matter how you do it, but I would definitely get it in with a fatty meal to help with that. And a tovacone we can, and perguanol or malarone is easier to take in a pill form. So see which one works um, and those can be helpful. 
Uh, Artemisia, we typically want to aim for at least in a whole leaf um, Artemisia, 800 to 1,000 milligrams a day. I typically divide it into two doses so that I don't have to take a handful of pills uh, or too much in one handful of pills because so many people are on a handful. If we use liposomal, there's been two studies showing liposomal artemisinin being um, four to five times more absorbable out of the gut of a mouse. So um, we can do dosing strategies of two twice a day. And a lot of times we'll do a little bit two day break with um, uh, for, th and so we'll do five days a week, three weeks out of the month and take another uh, week off. Um, and there's debate on whether that's necessary or not, but clinically it seems to be very useful. And our tesunate, um, if you can get it, might be good. It's kind of costly, but these are our three major sort of approaches to artemisia that we can use. So if we look at tefenaquin, it's kind of been published since, I think it was first published 2018, say, hey, you know, we can actually use this to treat Babesia microti successfully, um, and it basically kills the parasites. Um, and, and the nice part about this is our gold dose is 300 milligrams once a week. Um, we can start really low. We can work our way up to about a tablet. And then people feel that the peak blood levels are reaching about 12 weeks. And I say reportedly because... That's kind of from our clinical experience with Babesia um, um, in a Lyme literate world that when you're looking at everyone else using it, they're using it for such a short period of time that we don't even really know. So something to keep an eye on. Some people um, are doing as high as three to four tablets weekly or biweekly. I don't really see I need to go more than 300 milligrams once a week. Um, the other thing is one of the newer things that's been kind of mulled over recently is looking at a one tablet three times a day as a loading dose, and then going the one tablet to two tablets weekly. So that would be 150 milligrams times three days, then 150 milligrams weekly, potentially up to that 300. Uh, Premaquin um, is a daily, it's very similar. It's just um, sometimes easier to get insurance coverage, um, but you basically start at one a day and you work your way up to three tablets a day over several weeks, but that's the thing. You do have to take it daily rather than weekly. Um, both of these have methemoglobinemia re um, reported with it. Um, if you're over 300 milligrams a day of the tofenaquin, I should say a week, um, you're probably going to need to use something like methylene blue and monitor um, your pulse ox and your methemoglobin levels. Um, so again, like at the standard doses that are recommended, we generally don't see that. Um, the other thing is just watch out for G6PD deficiency. Um, and you kind of can use Primaquin. I tend to shy away from it, although, or I would shy away from it. I don't really see people with G6PD deficiency, but you need to check. Otherwise you're going to give them hemolytic anemia. And in both of these cases, it, it's interesting in order to prep for a Dapsone protocol, uh, uh, in order to prep for a Tefenaquin or a Primaquin protocol, you probably want to be doing similar lab tests. And then also in this approach, then we're going to back our way into the azithromycin and our enzymes as well. People are talking about Babesia nests. It kind of sounds very much like a biofilm. Um, and so the bottom line is we do need to be bringing down inflammation, opening biofilms in any of our protocols. Um, and I just gave you one order. We don't really know what the right order is. And that's the beauty of what we're doing here. We can treat that individual in front of us. And maybe it's azithromycin and tefenaquin. We don't really know yet. So um, maybe you guys can be, one of you can be the next person to come up with that, sort of that next piece of the puzzle here for all of us to help our patients get better quicker. Um, and then clofazamine uh, was published along with the tovaquone in combination to treat the Babesia microti. Um, it basically inhibits mycobacterial DNA. So what it does in Babesia microti, not really sure. Um, we're really basing our dosing on what we know from leprosy. And that's 300 milligrams once a month plus 50 milligrams daily um, for six to 12 months, or maybe we're going to do 100 or 200 milligrams a day until their symptoms are better and then decrease that dose. It's really, this is the wild west out there where we're kind of doing the very best we can. And so these are some of the dosing strategies that you could consider using. And I, if I were doing something like this, I would add the atovaquone at you know, 750 milligrams twice a day, um, along with one of these two approaches, depending upon um, which your patient seems to tolerate. So if we uh, shoot over to Bartonella for a moment here, Again, Dr. B uh, highlighted this really well with the foot and heel pain, the alcohol intolerance, and we have migratory peripheral neuropathy. 
as well as that transient and migratory uh, focal muscle fasciculation. We're having a little kind of like fasciculation here or there, then it moves over to the other arm and then to your chest or the side of your face. I see that very commonly. And this, I just wanted to point out, like compared to Babesia, we see a lot more mild anxiety and depression here but a lot more of the odd things like the OCD, the rage, that regression that looks like pans and pandas. If you have a kid who looks like they have an autoimmune encephalitis, but you know, that pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric syndrome, and you put them on an acute treatment and you include two intracellular drugs for Bartonella and they get better right away and it goes away, they probably just had Bartonella. The problem is Bartonella can also trigger that autoimmunity and you can have full-blown pans as well. The other thing is unilateral symptoms. People have right eye pain, right shoulder pain, right elbow pain, right hip pain, right knee pain, right, right sort of pelvic pain. That might be another symptom of Bartonella. And then as we talked, um, I think there's a picture here. Yeah, this is just another picture of um, Bartonella track marks. And this actually is from a study where they found some Bartonella in there. So we don't know that, um, you know, the Bartonella made those, but we believe with that vasoproliferative potential that the three, you know, Bartonella bacilliformis, Quintana and Hensley have, that that's probably what's go uh, going on. And I would agree with Dr. B is like, when you treat a lot of these people, all that red stuff goes away. Um, and one of the things I learned from Dr. Charles Ray Jones and a lot of other people talk about is if it's a Bartonella track, it should blanch if it's from that. So you can have a red mark from weight gain, but you have these red hot purple tips. You push on the tip, it blanches. The middle you push, it may or may not blanch. You treat them, they symptomatically get better. The tips start to look more skin tone, even if they're still scarring, but you no longer have that blanching. And that may be a pearl that says Bartonella was there and is also being effectively treated. Swollen lymph nodes are really common, especially in the cervical and the groin area in Bartonella. If you have lymphadenitis or painful lymph nodes without frank swelling, that may be more Lyme disease. And then as Dr. B talked about the subcutaneous nodules. Um, this is just some of the basic treatments that are recommended from up to date in the CDC, kind of a Z-pack for our acute Bartonella treatment. If that doesn't work, we might want to go to some longer treatments, uh, some of our other medications here. Um, and one of the things I think about Bartonella, and I try to remember all the time, is that we do have this um, phenomena where um, we don't really know what to do with Bartonella, right? If you go back to where did we learn from? And someone brought up in the Q&A there that we didn't get to today so far is brucellosis. Bartonella, Hensley, and, and Brucella abortus are so closely related genetically. And if you think about the way we look at treating um, Brucella, a six-week course of doxycycline has over 50% relapse rates. If we do doxy plus a second intracellular drug for 10 months, we still have around 20% relapse rates. And if you do doxy and um, Bactrim or trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, and rifampin for 18 months, you have less than a 5% relapse rate. The reason I bring this up is you should be looking for brucella titers. They're actually pretty miserable, but you know, our standard labs can at least give you a hint along with your Bartonella immunoblots. But also we have a lot of information in the world literature on how to treat things very similar to Bartonella. So if you're looking for things that are to help support why you're making a treatment protocol or learn more about where it comes from, brucella is a place to look. The other thing that stinks about Bartonella is unlike a urinalysis with a culture, and then we do a sensitivity and we say, oh yeah, you know, ciprofloxacin is going to work. We give it to you in like 99% of the time it works if you treat them long enough. In vitro sensitivities do not correlate well in Bartonella with in vivo. So all the information I'm about to tell you about treatment, take it with a grain of salt and treat that person in front of you. It's definitely important to use multiple antibiotics in this and certainly macrolides, which are commonly used like azithromycin, used alone typically and can lead to, at least in our test tube studies and Petri dishes, within as little as two to three generations, you can have resistance. And if Bartonella is reproducing five to six times a day on average in a Petri dish, you don't have a long time to get that second intracellular antibiotic or potentially herb on board to help prevent macrolide resistance. So always be thinking about double or triple intracellular agents. And this is across the board for me. How long do we treat for? Well, we talked in Babesia, maybe four to five months. 
Um, we know in Bartonella, if it's less than 15 days, which is essentially what we do with the ZPAC, we have high relapse rates. If you have things like um, an immune deficiency, like HIV, and you have um, bacillary uh, angiomatosis or bacillary pleos, uh, peliosis, um, where you're having those vasoproliferative lesions already, they're recommending in the general medical literature, three to four months of treatment at a minimum. Um, then like what I learned from Ray Jones is, and probably everyone else back in the beginning is treat until you're symptom free. And then maybe two more months, just, you know, and, but that's kind of like just trying to figure out what is going on what is the best approach in an area that we don't really know. But the thing is, we always want to be doing that reassessment thing. And I just think that if you get better on a treatment, then you remove the treatment and the symptoms come back, you still have the same darn pneumonia that you came to the hospital with. This is what they taught me in residency. And yet in Lyme and Bartonella, they're like, oh, it's a post somebody syndrome. It's really not. These are persistent infections that are known to relapse. And so when we go back to the medical literature and we look at say an immune compromised person and you go, oh, well, a Lyme person or a Bartonella person may not be immune compromised on lab data, but we know that the tick saliva suppresses Th1 you know, and Treg cells. So we're already just by definition, if you have Lyme disease, you could be in immune compromised state. It just might not be immunoglobulins or you know, the things that we're measuring in, in HIV. So we just have to look further. So the, the head in the sand thing doesn't work anymore for the rest of the, I mean, it might work for other folks, but not for us. We know that Lyme is suppressing the immune system. So all of the stuff we know about Bartonella and an immunocompromised person has the potential to help guide us in treating our patient. And it's certainly unlikely a new thing. Uh, and obviously we've talked this uh, quite a bit, relapse is known. So one of the things that's important um, and we've sort of alluded to that I wanted to talk about is exponential growth in strep 13,000 times in three days or, or per day. Um, so upwards of 40,000 times in three days. Bartonella babesia, maybe a couple of times a day, Lyme disease, you know, maybe as little as once every three weeks reproducing. So the logarithmic exponential growth phase of these infections is drastically different than most of our infections. But what's also different is this stationary form. If we go back to strep, rapid growth, it levels off as it has a lot of metabolites that are become of its own that are toxic to it, and it outstrips its nutrient supply. And essentially it hibernates a little bit and then dies. The problem is a little space in there is all of our tick-borne illnesses are well known to have persister states that can let them live for weeks, months, and maybe even years um, in a dormant state. So this stationary non-growing form is really an important one to be taking a look at. This was from 2017, the first time I was ever to able to even see a picture of a stationary phase cell. And the important part here is not to memorize all of this, but to understand that your typical cell changes completely and its metabolism is totally different when it goes from the logarithmic or exponential phase to the stationary phase. So as we continue to talk about treatments for stationary phase, it's critical that we focus on understanding it is different. And that's probably why our standard antibiotics don't work. So some of the studies, um, and these will, I'm going to go through a couple of slides quickly. Um, these are some slides from the work out of Johns Hopkins, where we found that methylene blue and clotrimazole, amongst a few other um, antibiotics, may be really helpful against these stationary forms. I highlighted these two because they're the ones that we can use in our clinical practice on a daily basis without getting into things like IV daptomycin or IV aminoglycosides. Now, it's interesting, they're also looking and they're breaking out not just the stationary phase, but biofilms specifically with Bartonella. And what we're seeing here is for the stationary phase, we've got some drugs we don't usually talk about um, popping up as really potential single agents that are effective. And things like uh, azithromycin and cefuroxime really aren't doing the job. Uh, one of the things that's really interesting here is nitrofrantoin because I've actually used this in combination with azithromycin in people with bladder issues and Bartonella, and it's actually seemed to make a pretty big difference, um, but I can't say that I use it a lot of other places, but I just wonder if that is part of that stationary Bartonella thing. And then one of the things is we've seen uh, methylene blue in one study come up really positive and we should use it. Lots of us have been using it. And then in this study by the same lab, it comes out that it's maybe not by itself as good. However, 
if we were to take and look at stationary forms and we combine some antibiotics, azithromycin, cipro, azithromycin, methylene blue, or the cipro methylene blue with rifampin, we see that we can actually annihilate these stationary forms. So now maybe we can start to come up with protocols. I would love to see this done with azithromycin, rifampin, and methylene blue, because really my question is when you look at azithromycin and like rifampin up at the top, the second one from the left, it doesn't really work. So I want to know if I'm doing my double intracellular coverage plus my methylene blue, does that unlock it again? Or if I put Cipro in with those two, will that unlock it? Because here, a lot of our common combinations don't seem to work. So hopefully we'll get that next level of at least in vitro study to help guide us. So if we look at single agents for biofilms, we see that methylene blue and rifampin are pretty darn good. Azithromycin, uh, not so much. And again, if we do the combinations though, where those same combinations are coming back. But what I really wanna highlight here is in day two or two, day four, it's not really doing anything. And it's only after six days. And this is direct application. So I don't know how to do the ratio to say, hey, what in your patient is really going to be the most, the, the duration in a human being, but I know it's gonna be long because six days of direct application of a medication on top of a bug is a pretty long time. So um, just keep that in mind that it might not be as quick as you might like. Uh, the other part too that I think is interesting is you don't actually see a lot of change here. In fact, some even look like they grew like with the azithromycin and Cipro. So you're not seeing a lot of change in the, you know, between two days and four days. So earlier on in your treatments, let your patients understand the expectation that they may not be improving as quickly as you want. And it may catch up very quickly once you get ahead of the game. So methylene blue is an MAOI. I haven't seen serotonin syndrome with it orally, but you can definitely get it IV. It will create blue urine and stain the toilet. So, and every once in a while with men, you're going to see a lot of dysuria. So be aware of that. Hypertensive crisis is possible. I don't tend to combine it with amphetamines, um, especially with the pandemic and no one wanting to go to the hospital when they need to. So typically um, I find that uh, 25 to 50 milligrams is a great dose twice a day. Um, and then air hunger and cognitive issues are places where it really shines. So this is one that you can be adding in with um, to go after the stationary forms. And it's also shown some anti-Lyme uh, properties as well. Um, I, as I said, uh, typically um, we do 50 milligrams uh, twice a day in adults. Some people go higher, some people go lower. We used to think we needed to do it liposomal or we wanted to, but then we had the studies come back that showed us, hey, the stand, the, we're getting the same blue urine in the toilet and in the in vitro studies, we're, kill, we're disrupting the biofilm. So now we can just go back to standard compounded methylene blue and save the people, uh, our patients about 50%. So there's no evidence that we need liposomal. Um, I do have a few people who get toxic really quickly, um, can't tolerate a lot of protocols. We've started as low as four milligrams a day and bumped them up to eight. And we've seen dramatic improvements. So sometimes more is not better. So sometimes you just need to go less. This will help soup up their mitochondria, help with autophagy and cleaning out. So very helpful, um, something that we use quite a bit. And I haven't seen um, significant long-term side effects after using it for four or so years now. Um, and I think I just said this twice, but cognitive issues, it does seem to shine there. And the other thing is breathing. So this was the world's first commercially available anti-malarial drug. And it's been shown not to be effective against the Bezia microti. But my question is with the, with the breathing and the air hunger improvements, is it the Bezia duncani otoquilii or one of these other ones that it is effective again? So we need to get more studies on it in the Babesias, but um, it's clinically kind of looks like it does uh, has some anti-Babesia properties. The other one that we use a lot clinically is clotrimazole. Got a couple of dosing strategies here for you. You can get it through the pharmacy, but then you're doing it four times a day in a dissolvable trochee that's for oral pharyngeal candidiasis. I really like sustained release for a couple of reasons. One is I can dose it twice a day. The other one is I know I get systemic absorption of this, which you're not really supposed to get with the trochee because I see elevated transaminases. So this is one, this is the most common drug in my practice to lead to LFT elevation. So you just gotta stay, uh, keep an eye on that. 
And again, this is an antifungal, so it shines in yeast. It shines in aflatoxins because it's been shown to, to neutralize them. And then in pans and pandas, a lot of our antifungals, but especially clotrimazole, appear to have like an immune modulatory effect, especially on our children. And so again, interesting, when we look at the herbs that can work for Bartonella in stationary forms of biofilms, our list looks almost exactly the same as it did before. And I will be providing you with a chart here in a moment that will help you with that um, to be able to go over, you know, and, and figure out which ones to use with which bug. So if we, we've just gone about 180 million miles an hour through the different bugs. And the reason for that is there's so much information out there. There's so many great papers. There's in-depth on double dose depth. So there's in-depth on disulfiram. I wanted to give you the clinical overview of how I'm using it in practice and also what I hear from other practitioners so that you have the ability to kind of treat that unique individual in front of you and also put your own twist on it with an evidence base as much as we have. So for me, I tend to use this little image in my head all the time. I draw it for patients. I go over because even if I'm using herbs, I can start to back my way into Babesia, Bartonella, even mycoplasma treatments, right? So we're going to talk about how to do that. But this is just, this is the picture that's in my head. And here's some of the herbs and the medications I might think about maybe in the first couple of times I see a patient. Obviously, the longer I've seen them or the more people they've seen before me, I might have to change what my treatment approach is. But I'm just kind of, this is like the picture in my head. So I remember all the things I need to be thinking about. So then I say, well, what if I'm thinking Lyme disease and then I get the BZ and my karate? Well, I've, maybe I'm going to consider using things like atovaquone, azithromycin, artemisinin, and maybe even tefenoquine. But then I go, okay, why would I choose a tetracycline or a macrolide? Well, I might choose a macrolide if they have Bartonella, if I think they might have a rickettsial infection or a relapsing fever infection like anaplasma or Borrelia mimotoi, I might go for tetracycline. If they have more joint pain, I might take the slightly more you know, um, uh, anti-inflammatory properties of a tetracycline and put that in, although macrolides work well there too. If I have someone who has mycoplasma or chlamydia and pneumonia, I may choose to start with a tetracycline as doxy is the drug of choice. However, if we have atypicals, then we're talking about macrolides. So then I go, oh, well, maybe if I'm thinking I've got mycoplasma, Babesia myocrati, and Lyme disease, and probably Bartonella, that might be a person where instead of starting with a cell wall agent and an intracellular, I start with a macrolide and a tetracycline, both of which are intracellular. I've got my double intracellular coverage for Lyme, for mycoplasma, and for Bartonella, and I have my macrolide that I could put in with my Babesia and whatever the other ones are. So that's kind of the way I start to think about it. I'm trying to think of all the possibilities and then dial in on that. Um, if I have Babesia Duncani, I don't have a lot of guidance of what medicines to use, but for me, I found that azithromycin and artemisinin backing into possibly malarone, the atovaquone proguanol clinically works exceptionally well. And I definitely, anybody who trains with me in the Lyme disease practitioner training program knows that I love my herbs here. I love the evidence-based herbs, but all of the evidence that we've talked about today is a starting point. It's not the finishing point. It's really that starting point because as, as we saw, Malt, Dr. Shappi is a great friend of mine. She's a great researcher. Her studies showed Stevie work. Dr. Zhang, another great friend, showed that it doesn't work. We need more research. So just remember that the number one clinical indicator of what's going on is the patient in front of you and then adding that research to it. But I like to start with the research because as a fully licensed physician and just a person who's a, a science nerd, I really want to just try to give my patient the best we have as a foundation and then we can riff on it. What about otocoilii? Well, we don't even know. We're having debate on whether or not there's human infections in the United States. But we also know that clinically, there are people who are helping people with some form of a Babesia or similar something get better with the protocol we have listed and we talked about earlier. So again, we don't always have all the guidance we want. So we have to get used to having a little bit of flexibility in our world and being a little uncomfortable, but foundation on the bench research and that clinical research.
If we have other Babesias, for me, I start with the evidence-based herbals, and then I walk my way back into the antibiotics. Now, if I have somebody who's got like hemolytic anemia and I find some sort of parasite on their blood smear, obviously I'm going to be also going straight to antibiotics, at least with my training and my license. But we, we need to think about if we're seeing these chronic people, you know, or we get that Babesia genus come back on an immunoblot that we want to maybe start at a place where we have a lot of control because a lot of our herbs, as you'll see in one moment, are titratable and our medicines are a little less titratable. So we can use them in combination really nicely. And also if you're, if you're someone who's supporting a patient who works with another provider who, ha who has the ability to prescribe medicines and you don't, this knowledge of these antibiotics will help you figure out where to put in these additional treatments and also help your patients with those potential treatment side effects. And so what about Bartonella henslei? Again, like I said, double intracellular coverage. Think about those other pathogens that help you do this. Like I was saying, like my one person is like, I've got her an azithromycin and it actually helps stabilize her. She's having these horrible urinary symptoms. They've worked her up, you know, to kingdom come and found nothing. And they just say it's all OCD and behavioral. I give her nitrofurantoin based on the research and also what nitrofurantoin is used for. And her urinary symptoms are dramatically improved. So again, do I have any study on azithromycin and nitrofurantoin in, in uh, you know, intravesicular Bartonella? No, but we, we, we look at it and we say, what do I know and how can I apply what I know from the broader perspective to that person in front of me? Um, same thing, evidence-based herbals here, because we can use some of the same herbals for Lyme, Bartonella, and Babesia. And then also a lot in Bartonella, I see methylene blue and clotrimazole really helpful. I will often start with the clotrimazole and other medications or herbs. If I have someone who's at the right place in their mycotoxin treatments, I may also hold off on clotrimazole if I'm only in the binding and mobilizing of the mycotoxin uh, part of my protocol before I get to my intranasal, my systemic treatment. So I may actually choose methylene blue sooner in a BART person who I'm treating with meds and concurrently treating for mycotoxins. Um, or I may just hold off on all of those depending upon the particular person. So sometimes I'm adding a medicine because of what I know, but sometimes I'm actually holding off on it for a while so that I don't blow up the other part of their protocol. And we talked about nitrofrantoin, uh, other Bartonellas, like Dr. B said, there's you know, 30, 40 some different Babesias and Bartonellas that we don't even really generally talk about because we're just starting to figure out what they are and do. So we have to use our clinical judgment. And in the end, treat that person who's sitting in front of you, follow the evidence as much as you can, and as much as it's, as it's clinically useful. I mean, you know, um, I saw a quote the other day, I should have thrown it in here, but it's like basically, you know, off-label use of medications is normal in medicine. It is what we are expected as physicians, nurses, and other medical providers to do, and it is our legal right to do that. So we have to apply that. And that's what I always think that when we're talking to other providers and we're talking to our patients, let's share the truth that we know today as best we know it, science-based. If they want to talk about conspiracy later, that's great, but let's talk the language of other clinicians. Let's talk the language of science and use it as our place to grow from, not as a limiter, but as actually a status place that starts us so we can have a conversation to get more people involved with actually being interested in treating the patients that we're all seeing because there's not enough of us to get all the work done. And so let's partner with them through science first. And really it's about innovating. That's how we got here. That's how I got better because people like Dr. Boriscano, Dr. Jones, Dr. Horowitz, and all the others who came before us were the ones who did this innovation and were on the chopping block for us. So now we have more evidence. It's more of that conversation, which is why I'm trying, you know, trying to reiterate that we have to use the science as our starting point. And then assess and assess and assess. Um, and not only the patient, but don't get stuck in your diagnosis. I've had people come in with cysts on their head that were actually breast metastasis things. And like Dr. B said, cysts and biofilms are electron microscopic things. So you're not finding them on people. These Bartonella things on the sides of the legs and inner arm are not Lyme cysts. We have to be really clear on what we're talking about and also help our patients know that because I have a patient with metastatic breast cancer that she was told her air hunger going up the stairs was because she had Babesia. I'm like, well, it could be, 
but it could also be something else. So just remember our lives happen. And a lot of times we get these tick-borne illnesses by spending time doing the things we love a lot of times outdoors and sometimes even just indoors. So just be aware and keep your differential open and definitely still be treating them for their tick-borne infections. As promised, here's a little cheat sheet for you to refer to later, um, just about some of the major herbs that came up in the research and whether they work for growing or non or non-growing or stationary forms and um, kind of where some of that stuff comes from. So um, I have the papers listed there you can find. And then also um, just remember that some of the in vitro stuff doesn't correlate to in vivo and different in vitro studies show different results. So just go with what you're seeing. And as a summary, um, you know, I think we've talked a lot about tick-borne co-infections. They're much more frequent than we used to think, uh, at least as a general medical society. There, and then there's an increased risk of co-infection when you get bit, which can make diagnosis and treatment harder. So really look at the person in front of you um, and just remember about the stationary forms and the different things and the, how the combinations of what we're doing, if they don't look, if you think it's right, but it's not working, a lot of those combos that we think are right are shown at least in vitro to not necessarily work. So we need more. So don't get stumped there, right? While we're waiting for that extra research, just change it up and see how things go. Um, but there's so much evidence for persistence of Lyme and lack of cure. So just know that that's out there and what you're doing is so necessary. And like I said, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for people like Dr. Boriscano and all of you doing this. So thank you so very much. I just wanna take one moment to show a couple of resources because I see I'm two minutes over. Unlike Dr. Boriscano who came in two minutes ahead of time, um, we've got resources, just a couple of dosing strategies for some herbs. Um, for those of you who may not use these on a regular basis, if you happen to be seeing kids, um, I learned this basic calculation from Dr. Alexis Chesney, who I saw was on today and I just saw her last week. So always a pleasure. She has an amazing book on the herbal approaches to Lyme disease and other co-infections. So definitely check that out. But this is a really important uh, dosing strategy to help you sort of come up with what those doses could be. A couple of other ticks that you might wanna know where the Ehrlichia and Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever or Star Eye may come from. Keep these in mind. I know someone talked about um, uh, Q fever and tularemia earlier in the q and I definitely uh, see that uh, a lot of our standard lab testing can pick those up, but sometimes you do need to go above and beyond. Um, and then for last thing is anybody who's interested in a little bit of a deeper dive into the top five herbs that I like for Lyme disease, you can grab, go over to my website at originsofhealth.com slash connect. Just um, let us know if you're a patient or provider. Um, it's all real simple. We'll get that sent right over to you. Um, if you're a provider and you're interested in learning more about um, mentorship, I have a year-long mentorship program um, with um, an intensive uh, six-month portion where we're you know, studying all of this in super detail called the Lyme Disease Practitioner Certification Program. Happy to have you all join us because um, we're all on the same mission to alleviate the suffering of people with chronic tick-borne illnesses. So thank you so very, very much for having me. And... I think we're done our screen share there, Joe. Okay, excellent. Thanks so much, Dr. Moorcroft. That was fantastic information. And if you have any questions, I, we have about 10 minutes. We can take some questions. Uh, just enter them in the Q&A box. Uh, you should see that at the bottom or the top of your screen. And if we don't get to your questions, I mean, we have so many right now, we will follow up next week on all the testing and treatment related questions, but we'll get to a few of them right now. Um, I can read some of these, but uh, Dr. Moorcroft, uh, some of these words I probably can't pronounce, but do you use monocycline in those below 10 years of age? Yeah, so um, minocycline, uh, tetracycline derivative, typically we're trying to not use it um, in patients below eight. Um, and Dr. Uh, Jones and I talked about this extensively. He said, the re and, and I confirmed it with the research, it's really below seven is where we don't want to use chronic tetracyclines. The exception though, and you can find this in the CDC website, is in children who you, ex you suspect have Rocky Mountain spotted fever, anaplasma, or ehrlichia as acute infections, you should treat them um, with like that 10-day course of them, irregardless of what we think about the teeth staining. Teeth staining in a short course is unusual. It can happen. We actually have ways to uh, reverse that now, but the, the risk of things like 
leukopenia and thrombocytopenia and even death in some of these infections um, are, are so high that you would want to go ahead and treat them. But from a chronic perspective, we typically wouldn't put uh, someone under eight on a longer term course of uh, a tetracycline um, without a really good reason. Great. Can you expand on what your follow-up looks like? Is it retesting labs or is it a specific questionnaire? Yeah, that's an awesome question. Um, and I do a couple things. I um, have a questionnaire that people follow up and they fill out on a regular basis. It's just in our electronic medical record. It scores frequency and severity of symptoms. It's kind of a combination of Dr. Horowitz's validated questionnaire, which comes out of a lot of Dr. Borscano's work. And it's kind of a conglomeration of that and it's age and sex and menstrual status um, specific. And we just follow the numbers. So it's subjective. And then I take that and I put that with their clinical piece. And my follow-ups, I, I generally see people. And then in a, after I start a major treatment, like an antibiotic protocol, if it's a new patient, I follow them up in four weeks. And then usually every six to eight weeks, typically landing on every eight weeks thereafter. Um, and then but in between, like I'll follow up every two or, or four weeks, depending, I leverage my team a lot um, to make sure that I can kind of see the patient as much as necessary. But if I only need to, the check-in only needs to be a couple of key questions. I just come up with those key questions with the patient in a visit. And then I have my team ask those. Um, but when in doubt, I see I'll, you know, if something comes up funky, we see them more frequently. So that's our, our, our core part. If they have an abnormality, like in a blood count or metabolic panel, liver functions, white cells, whatever, and an elevated LDH or something like that, that I'll follow up depending upon the level, anywhere from once a week to once every six or eight weeks. Typically, as a lot of us know, that's going through insurance. For my specialty testing, it kind of depends, is patient specific. Um, and also like Lyme, I don't redo the immunoblots too frequently because it's going to take four to six, seven months for it to change. Whereas my Bartonella and my Babesia immunoblots, and then it, or if you're using a titer, they're going to change more rapidly, uh, at least in my experience. And um, I so I may do those more frequently, um, but typically I don't retest the tick-borne infections more frequently than every six months. Great. How long are the Borrelia round body off on cycles and how many cycles? Um, that is also um, probably the most famous uh, response in the Lyme world, <laughs> which is as many as you need. Um, typically what I see with, um, tet uh, if we took tenidazole and I did the three days on and four days off, I typically find in someone where it's really necessary and it's gonna make a difference for them, there's gonna be a three to four week, um, the first go round where they're gonna get kind of beat up and then I'm going to see they're going to get less and less beat up or Herxheimer's while we're actually on it. And so then after they start to stabilize, I start to look for, I, I, I start to look for the symptoms to um, sort of um, balance out like off the treatment. And then I look for people to continue to improve and improve. And when they stop, that could be three or four or five months. Um, I've certainly done cycles that have lasted over 12 months. Um, but typically I would say somewhere in the neighborhood of four to eight months between the 250 and then the 500 BID, rarely going a little higher. Great. Should we use GSH and B-complex with disulfiram to prevent neuropathy? Um, I use a lot of it just because I don't know what else to do. I mean, <laughs> there's so many things you could put in there. Those are kind of core pieces of, of what we do um, in our practice and very much like what I do in uh, tetra, um, tinidazole or metronidazole. I would definitely be looking at things like the B-complex and liposomal glutathione. Um, while in the long run, I probably want to get people making their own glutathione better. In the short run between its anti-inflammatory properties and its detoxification properties and being the master antioxidant, it's a kind of a core go-to for, uh, for me. Okay. I, I see a few questions about SOT, SOT therapy. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any comments on that, Dr. Moorcroft? Um, I don't personally um, prescribe it or utilize it. I have a few patients who've done it. I've spoken to a lot of clinicians about it and their experience. Um, I think the people who offer it say that 
It can definitely help improve your symptoms and decrease your duration of treatment by about six months. The problem is I don't know how long, just like my tinnitus is all answer. I don't know how long the duration of treatment is. So I don't know how we can make that statement. Um, I think in a small group of people, it's probably very effective. And in a larger group of people, um, I, I just haven't seen any data or um, experience that it, that it does. I think that that's another place where it's a, it's a great emerging potential and it would be great to see some more research on it before we start to widely recommend it. Cause um, it's extremely expensive compared to a lot of the other things we're doing. Great. Do you have an educational resource for learning how to dose and source methylene blue? Um, probably your website. Um, I think that when, when everybody gets the slides at the beginning of the week, um, certainly there's the general methylene blue, um, dosing. I mean, like I said, it's 25 to 50 milligrams twice a day. Some people go higher, some people go lower. I mean, it's part of the reason we created the mentorship is not every patient can handle 50 milligrams twice a day of methylene blue. And, and it, the question is like, how do you figure that out? And it's like talking to a whole bunch of other people who've done it and, and kind of come up with that group consensus. Um, yeah. And there's a bunch of compounders that do it. I mean, Infuserve tends to be one of the least expensive and, and they, they typically have it. Um, some of my other compounders have a hard time following, uh, finding it. So it's kind of like with cholestyramine, you have to find one or there's one or two pharmacies that really have it. And you just got to go to those guys. Um, but like I said, I don't find you need liposomal. Um, and with any of these things, with the exception of a few antibiotics that really need a standard dosing, things like methylene blue and tinidazole are not felt to be leading to bacterial or parasitic resistance if we start low and go slow. So if you're uncomfortable with that, just make sure that you do that. Um, you know, keep an eye, um, just start a little lower and go slower. But yeah, certainly reach out at our website and always happy to help guide people with additional resources. And I, I guess since we're talking about it, we do have a healing Lyme disease summit coming out in May. Um, that'll be a free resource to the public and practitioners. And so hopefully we'll be talking a little bit more about methylene blue during that to be another resource for people. Excellent. We have time for a, a few more questions here. Should patients with Lyme or any co-infections be blood or organ donors? That is an amazing question. I was told after I got Babesia that I can never donate blood again. And I looked at all the research for that. And it's really funny that like, um, I'm not allowed to get blood again, at least as of a handful of years ago, yet I'm cured with 10 days of treatment. <laughs> kind of makes me wonder, you know, um, there, there are studying, um, uh, people with babesiosis and looking and there, the newer sort of concept is maybe if you're asymptomatic for two years and your blood tests are negative, you may be able to donate. Um, I'm a little concerned about that. Um, if you're, and at the moment I would be hesitant because we just don't know. And we know as Dr. B pointed out, there is transplacental and uh, transmission. There is some evidence of possible sexual transmission, although it's not confirmed. But what we do know is these are tissue organisms. And we also know that we don't know, we have no test of cure. And so um, I would say just if you're someone who's interested in, in donating until we know some more information, maybe consider donating um, you know, uh, at the end of life, at least to like an, an anatomy department rather than an organ for use until we know more information. And I could be completely wrong. I don't really know. I'm just saying I'd rather err on the side of caution until we, uh, get a little bit better information. Excellent. And a, a last question. I, I see a few questions, uh, related to clotrimazole. Uh, what form of clotrimazole is the most effective as a systemic treatment? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I saw one other in here. I'd love to just like uh, kind of throw in there, Joe was, um, you know, so the, the clotrimazole, um, what I love to do is get it compounded in a sustained release capsule. So if the person you're working with is able to take a capsule, um, you know, and I'm mostly thinking about children and some of our adults, the sustained release makes dosing easier. Um, the frequency is only twice a day, but then the other thing is we do see that transaminitis on a regular, on a relatively regular basis. Um, and, you know, probably maybe 15, 20% of the people who use it. So we're looking at seeing a systemic change from that. So I, that's kind of how I gauge the fact that it's getting systemically absorbed, um, through the pharmacy, you can get the regular trochee. That's an oral dissolvable. 
Um, they can swallow it. It probably will get some absorption, but it's, it's really not well known for that. Um, so that's kind of the way I go about it. Um, and I use Pioneer Pharmacy in Vernon, Connecticut, primarily for that one, although there are many other really good ones. Um, and then there's just a, just to dovetail, Joe, there's a quick question on, um, is mold tox, is mold treatment necessary? We didn't really get into this today um, because of the scope of what we were talking about, but I kind of just look at it all as like my cup, right? You have a vessel that has an amount of, of toxicity and stuff that it can deal with. And then you have an amount of toxins that are in that vessel. So really for me, we have two questions is like, how can I enlarge this, the volume of the vessel and decrease the amount of junk the vessel needs to hold? So when I look at mycotoxin treatment, I say, well, a lot of my patients live in mold, right? They live on the Northeast. There's mold everywhere. They may even have mold in their dorm room, their office, their home, and they're fine. But then they go. And so maybe they're sitting here and they have this level of toxicity, but then they go and they get bitten by a tick or if they're kids and they get licensed school, their toxicity runneth over. So it's really about where can I, what is the toxin load? I, I, I think about this concept um, I talk about called chronic toxin overload. How many toxins do they have and where, what are the ones that their body's prioritizing? Because I know that a lot of us are exposed to 10, 20, 30 different things. We all have Wi-Fi routers. We, some of us have more natural light than not. Some of us are, you know, um, watching TV all the time. And some people that bothers some people, it doesn't, some people live in a polluted area more so than another, but our unique genetic makeup and our ability to detoxify and the amount of toxins that we're dealing with make us that unique individual. So as an osteopathic physician, we were trained that the body is a self-healing mechanism has an ability to heal itself and, and to regulate itself. So as a provider, I go, where's the body stuck? where the one or two main things it needs and how do I catalyze healing and then get the heck out of the way. So my goal is always to use all the treatments we talked about today to help the body get to the next level of health and then move it away and let the body do the work. And I find that mold toxin treatment is often very critical in treatment. I do not ascribe to you have to do it first or second or third or at the same time. I find that every person's a little different. So in my bag of tricks, a lot of it is treating for toxins and getting mold toxins out, lime toxins, heavy metals, getting the gut right, but also looking at immune system function, that autoimmunity we've talked about and balancing it and then bringing down inflammation and just opening up the detox pathways. And so it is unique. So I don't, I, I love that we have all these different protocols, but when I sit down with my patient, I say, I know all these protocols, you know, more cross protocol, you know, Boriscano's protocol, you've got Horowitz and Jones, you've got Neil Nathan, you've got so you just keep naming protocols you know, I've done a Zyto and I know this or whatever. You take that protocol and then you apply it to the unique person in front of you. And you say, oh, I'm going to make a plan. I'm going to do the next three things that you need. And then I'm going to reassess you. And the next step, the next part of a protocol we're going to apply is going to be what your body tells us it needs at that reassessment, at that follow-up. Um, but yes, I do see that mold is, is one of the bigger players, but it doesn't always happen to go first, at least in my patient population. Excellent. Um, yeah, Dr. Moorcroft, I, if you want to just scroll through any of the questions, I mean, you certainly can answer any right now or, um, you know, we'll follow up um, after the call. We have so many questions. Uh, we'll be able to answer them next week. But yeah. if there's anything that stands out, by all means. Well, uh, I do. Actually, there's a question about Bartonella treatment and newly acquired, um, um, not newly acquired, with, only with the evidence-based herbals. I actually have, I mean, I do a lot of herbs first um, in chronic people. And I find that if we start that way, then we know what to add in or not. And I have a lot of people who prefer not to use medicines. They've come to me after using medicines with other people. And we do, we are able to do that. And so a lot of what I find is that we do need those evidence-based herbals. We need to do all the functional medicine things. And also, like I said, the differential in conventional medicine is key. Um, but you can utilize a lot of um, homeopathics with that to help along with the herbs. Um, a lot of uh, different things. I use a lot of modified citrus pectin um, that's lime flavored as a base for these tinctures. And I find that that helps the gut and brings down inflammation uh, in and of itself. That can be really helpful. So I've definitely seen that um, happen. Um, 
And, you know, um, that we can do it naturally. Uh, you know, we don't have, we, we don't really have studies on cure in, in medicines either. So, I mean, it's just kind of like that unique person. And if I remember years ago, we, I talked with um, Wayne Anderson about this and, he, and, and I've had the same exact experience. It's like the people who want only herbs typically need meds and the people who only want meds and don't believe in herbs typically need herbs. So just keep all the tools on the table and don't be wed to one or the other, I would say. Um, and also it's like, if you have, someone is asking a question about like, if you've been sick for 25 or 30 years, I was sick for eight years. I had no clue what the heck was going on. My back was against the wall. And just like when my boss found me staring at a wall about six years into it, I found myself out of my apartment staring at the wall. And I saw that I had two, two sort of pathways in front of me. And the one pathway was I'm going to continue to have this shitty life and it's just going to get worse and worse and worse and go downhill. And then there was this other thing where I saw all my dreams and and it's really easy. We all know what dreams we're losing, right? We're all just like, Oh my God, like I I want to do this and this and this, and you get all bummed out about it. Well, maybe don't get bummed out about it. Focus on that. And I just said, like, if I, if I, in my mind, decide that I'm going to get that no matter what, but I'm not going to figure out how, see, this is where we get stuck with healing And this is where all the nuts and bolts we just talk about and all these protocols kind of get in our way sometimes is you just have to decide what you want the future to look like and it'll start to happen. And it might not be, and this is the thing, like when we look at the treatment, uh, all the things of the azithromycin and methylene blue or azithromycin and Cipro, we see that day two and day four, there's not even much of a change. In fact, azithromycin and Cipro got worse. It more grew in four days, but then on day six, you see zero or alive, right? So it's almost like if you, if anyone uh, knows how bamboo grows, um, you know, everybody thinks it just grows like a gazillion feet in a day, right? Or in a, in a, in a, in a week. But what happens is it's got a standard growth, growth rate. And it, in order to be able to sustain a stock that's super high and shines for everybody to see, and we use it for all kinds of cool stuff, it needs a massive root ball. So a lot of what's growing from uh, bamboo is under the ground and you don't see it. And then when you see it, it's like, boom, the result is instantaneous and amazing. So a lot of what we see in tick-borne illnesses, we focus too much on the end result, which is like, we've labeled it no more Lyme, no more Bartonella, rather than saying, hey, I want this result in the end. And then, because when you know what you want, rather than what you're losing, but what you truly want, you're, you're, you're brain and you will start to make that happen. And then you're going to be able to do a little more today than you did yesterday. But just remember that's only day two, right? And in human time, day two, may be a year or two or 10 years. So we don't know when your day six is coming, but it'll happen. Um, I've seen a lot of people sick for five, 10, 15 years where they actually can get better and certainly way longer than that. It's just a matter of more treatment, I would say that more treatment may work if you know what you're treating. And it's not always the tick-borne infection. And Ray Jones, to, to kind of close this statement, Joe, because I know I'm rambling, Ray Jones put this so well. It's an infection or toxin-triggered autoimmune encephalitis. And I think of everybody that way as a basic foundation. So I want to get rid of the toxins. I want to work on those infections. But what I realize is those infections can set up autoimmunity. And over here, if I get rid of the infections, the autoimmunity can still keep going. And that autoimmunity sets up inflammation as does the infection. And that inflammation, which could be uh, in pain, it could be a nervous system or an emotional cycle, right? Anxiety, depression, or whatever, that can be self-perpetuating in the absence of ongoing infection and in the absence of ongoing autoimmunity. So we need to look at all those three broad categories and come up with a solution. So a lot of people are chronically sick, may have some active infection, but other parts that they could also be looking at. So don't, when you're looking for more treatment or your provider providing more treatment, this is where we step back and we look and say, why are they still sick? Is it still the Bartonella or is it the effect of Bartonella? And I think that post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome gets this really bad rap. It's a real thing. The problem is the people who use that word tend to forget chronic Lyme disease is the real thing too. And you can have either or, or both at the same time in my experience. And that's the part where when we're open to more things, then we open to that um, next level of healing.